Adam, you're on mute. I was just practicing my speech to myself before I actually went live. So we're going to have to get used to this Zoom thing if we're going to be dealing with COVID. So we might as well uh, learn how to unmute ourselves. So welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. For those uh, live on Zoom or watching from around the world, uh, this is the reopening task force. Um, we were going to meet in a second floor classroom at AMS today, but uh, it became a brick oven. Um, so we're instead meeting via Zoom. So. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I, what I'd like us to do is if all of the panelists who are a part of this committee could in the chat introduce yourselves to each other, just say uh, what your role is in the school system and um, put that in the chat. The public who is watching will be able to see that as well. So um, that would be a good way for us to introduce ourselves and to keep us moving. Um, but in general, the organization um, of this, uh, yes, Sheila, you're in the right place. Um, the organization of this reopening task force is uh, we will be meeting um, over the course of the next several weeks to prepare for uh, this fall. Um, we have several subcommittees. So there is a school nurses and medical professionals subcommittee um, that's being chaired by Deanna Quartz. Uh, principals and administrators uh, subcommittee chaired by Dr. Bernasconi and Anna Perel. Um, this, this committee will also include administrators from our community who live, uh, live here but work in other school districts. There is a faculty, staff, and association subcommittee that will include all of our uh, labor organizations that will be chaired by Stephen O'Keefe, and they'll be responsible for gathering feedback from all of our faculty and staff. We have a parents and community members subcommittee chaired by Tricia Town. Um, and I will mention that there were, uh, I think, about 100 parents who volunteered to be part of that subcommittee, which we're uh, very happy to know that there's that much interest and concern uh, from our community. We have a students subcommittee that will be chaired by the Community Council moderator, Maddie Daniel. And then there is a social emotional support subcommittee, which will include our school social workers and is chaired by Shilu Joshi Fligal. Um, and so that's the organization um, of our group. And uh, as for our schedule, so we're meeting today and the purpose today is for me to uh, provide some initial data from both the survey that we've put out uh, to parents and staff, um, and then also to gather some initial input from you as task force members. Between tomorrow and June 29th, uh, we're gonna ask each subcommittee to meet at their own schedule and using uh, whatever method they would like to meet, uh, whether Zoom, in person, whatever. Um, to gather initial feedback from uh, members of those various subcommittees. On June 30th, we'll meet again as a task force and each subcommittee will report back the initial feedback they gathered from their subcommittees about what uh, they think our plans should be for the fall. And then between June 30th and July 14th, I'll draft a reopening plan um, that I'll present to the task force on July 14th. So taking all of the feedback from today, all the feedback that I receive on June 30th from all of the subcommittees who report, um, I'll draft a, an initial reopening plan that I'll present to you all on July 14th. Uh, between July 15th and the 20th, I'll ask the subcommittees to meet one more time to re review that draft plan and provide feedback. Uh, July 21st, subcommittees will all report back that feedback from their subcommittees uh, about the draft plan. And then on August 4th, I'll present to each of you a final plan and ask for your approval. Assuming that uh, this group is able to do that work and be done on August 4th, that leaves August 19th for me to present this to our SAU board and to move forward. Uh, one obvious logistical issue there is uh, we're not going to be able to wait until August 19th to begin the planning efforts in our schools. And so frankly, uh, even after today, we get initial feedback from you folks, we'll start loosely putting together uh, what we think we need to be doing for the fall. Um, but uh, it will be a rolling process uh, and I believe we'll be doing just, uh, we'll, we'll have plenty of time to do what we need to do uh, to move forward. So I've identified what I believe are the six major questions that this group needs to answer this year. Uh, there might be others that you bring forward today that we can add to this list, but as we begin our initial subcommittee meetings, I'm going to ask that these six questions frame our work. And so those are uh, number one, uh, and let me share my screen so you can see where this is coming from. So in our Trello board, um, this list of major questions. So number one, is the remote modality a choice for all parents or only those with validated medical concerns? 
meaning uh, this past school year, we had every parent uh, had the option for remote or in-person and that, uh, that um, choice could vary uh, uh, frequently and rapidly uh, if need be. And so as we approach the fall, is that the same option that's available or do we limit the remote modality to only those that can validate some sort of significant medical concern that's not ameliorated by a vaccine? Um, there is an assumption that I'm making that uh, vaccination availability uh, may be present uh, by the fall for all of our students. So students down to age five, that may not be the case. It may be that vaccination availability doesn't uh, become available until after our school year starts or doesn't become available in time for uh, students as young as five to receive both doses and be two weeks post-vaccination. But that's a, a conversation piece. Second question is based on the initial parent feedback about modality preference. How do we support uh, remote learners and deploy staff resources? And I'll share those that survey data in just a moment. Um, third, are our safety protocols dependent on vaccination availability for students? What I mean by this is uh, until vaccination is, in, is available for all of our students, we already know what's available for all of our staff and all of our students down to age 12. Um, but do we carry responsibility as a school district to have different protocols in place for students who have not been vaccinated or not have the availability to be vaccinated quite yet? Four, which safety protocols need to remain in place for the in-person environment in the fall, if any? Uh, five, what social emotional resources and supports need, need to be in place for students next year that are directly related to the COVID-19 crisis? And finally, and somewhat related, which resources should be deployed to support students who may have been out of the in-person environment for 18 months by the fall. Uh, and this again makes an assumption that some students who have not stepped foot in our school system since March 2020 might be returning to the in-person environment in the fall. And so I think again those are the, the six major questions that this group needs to tackle uh, this summer. Uh, moving on, I'd like to share that survey data I mentioned uh, a moment ago. Uh, so let me share that with you now. So we asked parents uh, about their thoughts for the fall, and I don't know how big this is for you folks, so I'll make it a little bit uh, larger. But uh, the, the three major questions were, do you plan to have your child vaccinated for COVID-19 once it's available? Uh, yes, 58%, no, 21%, and 21% prefer not to share. After vaccinations are available for children who are the age of your child, do you believe masks should still be required inside school buildings? This question received a lot of feedback because parents uh, didn't like some of the phrasing of it, but really I was trying to get at one of those core questions about whether uh, safety protocols are dependent on vaccination availability. And so no, 69%, yes, 31%. And then uh, most significantly, as of today, if you were offered a choice, which modality would you anticipate being your primary choice for next school year? 98% in-person, 2% uh, remote. And then the breakdown by grade, you can see that uh, 11th grade has five students, five parents that would have chosen remote, but every other grade level has one or two, uh, and then first grade three. So a, a very small number of parents who responded to the survey, which is about half of our parents, half of our students are represented by the survey. So a decent, um, uh, a, a decent uh, participation rate uh, and very small numbers uh, would, would have chosen the remote modality. And this is about uh, almost a month ago now that this survey was sent out. Um, so with that said, um, those are the, the initial comments and uh, framing of this work. And so I wanna pause there and ask if anyone on the, the task force has any, uh, uh, key questions to add to that list of key question, questions for us to answer. If anybody has any uh, questions about the process or, uh, and then we'll get to initial thoughts about the fall after that, but are there any questions about the process or, um, uh, uh, yes, Beth, um, or uh, um, any feedback so far? So anybody? Hearing none, no one's unmuting, no one's giving the nonverbal signs that they're about to say something. Um, so uh, I'll move on. So um, hear, hearing that data from our, uh, from our parents, um, does anyone have any initial impressions about what our plans for the fall uh, might need to look like? Uh, 
I, I guess I'll go first if that's right with you. I think it's really important that we as a committee kind of map out as best as we possibly can for the community about that return to normal or the new normal and what that actually looks like. Uh, so parents can feel confident and comfortable sending their kids into our buildings in September, as well as making sure our faculty and staff are also comfortable as well. Uh, there's still going to be apprehension about that, and I think that's kind of the, uh, the, the root of where our hard work is going to come from over the course of the next two months. Others? Go ahead, Sheila. Um, I think it will be important. We've been talking at the high school level and I know at the middle school level, they've been talking as well about um, really thinking about the social emotional needs, especially of those students who have been remote since March 2020 um, and providing some sort of a um, before school starts, this is what it's going to look like experience, um, whether that's a half day, a full day, um, kind of whatever the students may need, but I know that there are a number of kids who just haven't made it in quite yet. And to alleviate that anxiety, it would be important to provide something like that. Adam, I, I concur with Steve also, um, um, just the need also to engage all of the, the the staff that haven't been in the building um, over the years re-engaging um, re -engaging staff along with students back into the building. Steven, I'm sorry, I didn't. My brother, Steve, sorry about that. Maddie, from a student's perspective, I wonder if you might be willing to share from your peers about uh, to that point uh, what you think might be beneficial in, in uh, helping some students transition back. Yeah, so I can definitely talk about that. Thanks, Adam. Um, so first off, I would just like to say I know a lot of students were really happy um, these last two days when the mask mandate was lifted at the high school. That brought some big cheers to both um, the students and the staff, although because um, most of us are vaccinated at this point or those who choose to be vaccinated have at least gotten one shot, um, which includes most of my friends um, as well. Um, although I do know as being a remote student this whole year, I think that brings a bit of a unique perspective because I've seen it from the remote modality and I've seen like little freshmen who spent their entire year all online and they don't know what the high school looks like. So I think Shilu brings up a really good point when she says that we need to be providing opportunities over the summer for those remote students to come into the building and see what school looks like. Because it, I mean, they're gonna need orientation days too, just like our incoming class of freshmen. Um, so I think that's super important. Yeah, speaking for myself, I remember last, uh, uh, I think it was last April, uh, after we were all kind of been locked down for a while, my first time going back into a school building, I, I felt anxiety myself. And it had only been like a month, six weeks, something like that when I'd been out of all of the school buildings. So I can't even imagine for students from their perspective. And Maddie, thanks for sharing that. I didn't, I didn't want to out you as a, uh, a remote student this whole year, but thanks for, thanks for sharing that perspective. No worries at all. I'm happy to talk all about it. So uh, I guess I want to dive into some of the questions and just get our initial impressions. And I, I, I want to uh, caution everyone, including the public, that uh, these discussions are being done in public on purpose so that our community can see us as we deliberate. And uh, it's worth noting that last year, some of the initial impressions we had for the fall that I shared or others shared in these public meetings turned out not to be what our final plans were. Uh, in fact, um, our final plan uh, had a lot of things that were, were discussed uh, later and part of the process. So I don't want uh, anyone to, to hold us uh, to what we say today, but, but really trust the process that if we speak um, with transparency, uh, that will get us to a good place. And so starting with the, the, the first question, uh, what is the opinion of, of the folks in the task force about whether uh, or not a remote should be something that is uh, a free and open choice for all parents or something that's restricted in some way. Go 
Go ahead, Katie. Yeah. Can I ask a question, Adam? Would it maybe you don't know the answer to this yet, but if there were to be a remote option, would it require like our staff doing that? That's certainly a corollary question is is uh, depending on this question hinges on what resources are then necessary because in in my opinion, and again, my opinion from the starting point here, not the final plan, if it's one or two people per grade level, I think we can look at unique and probably even specific to the individual situation solutions for those individual students. If the choice exists and it becomes five or even 10 students per grade level, I think now we're looking at something similar to this year where some uh, deployment of staff is necessary or redeployment of staff is necessary to cover the remote circumstances. Now, now you would like our opinions on that? I would. My personal opinion is I don't think remote should be an option. Um, I feel like, well, actually, let me preface this by saying elementary only if um, kids are not able to get vaccinated. I feel like once we get to that point where everyone can have the option to be vaccinated and um, if you're choosing not to be vaccinated, then I feel like maybe you know, another choice like homeschooling or VLAX or something like that. Um, but maybe not until that option is there for all students. Go ahead, Beth. Um, I was just jumping off of what Katie said. I think that we need to move forward with two plans until we know for sure when vaccinations are going to be available for all ages, or at least down for our students. Um, because we can't assume that they're going to be available in time for everybody to get fully vaccinated. So we need to plan for both. Um, and so I think this particular question might have two answers, like Katie said, that if vaccinations are available for everybody, maybe we shouldn't have um, remote options for anybody unless there's a validated medical concern that doesn't allow them to get the vaccine. Or um, if vaccinations aren't available, I think eliminating students from the school system simply because they can't get vaccinated, it might not be the right choice either. Stephen, thank you for using the raise hand feature and then Pim, go ahead. Uh, the one thing I just wanna say is, is we can't lose sight of, that we learned an awful lot over the last year about the way our school operates, our employees uh, flourish and, and flounder and our students flourish and flounder. Um, and it can't be denied that there are some students that really did well in the remote environment. And so to continue to offer that, if we um, deny them that opportunity next year, uh, I do believe that we uh, did not learn anything from the last year. Uh, and offering that option to a student that uh, could be individualized as a part of our, uh, our district-wide uh, strategic plan, making sure that kids do have an opportunity to um, experience their educational uh, experience in the way that they feel is most suitable to them uh, and doing that in a remote environment if that's something that we believe as as a district and as an administration as a faculty and as a community think that that's something that we want to continue to offer that's something that should be up for conversation and whether or not uh, the faculty and staff want to engage me in that i hope they do uh, that's some of the things that i'd like to take my subcommittee through because i i really want to make sure that we learn um, or use the lessons learned over the last year to to, to make us better and not just go back to the old normal just for the sake of going back to the old normal. All right, Stephen, I've added a seventh question um, to our list of key questions, which I'm not sure I typed it well uh, on the fly, but should a remote option be available for students who found success in, in the remote modality unrelated to COVID? Did that get it? Okay. Uh, Pim and then Dr. Bernasconi. Thanks. Uh, so first of all, um, I echo a lot of the stuff that Beth mentioned, uh, but Steve brings up great points. Um, I certainly wouldn't want anybody um, that really excelled in that um, modality to be withheld from, from doing so in the future. Um, but it, it has to be obviously properly um, you know, staffed and you know, the, all the other um, I guess concerns or not necessarily concerns, um, but just the infrastructure that that's required to be able to sustain that uh, moving forward. So that's something that needs to be looked at and to see if it 
it makes sense. Um, you know, if it's a very small population, it might be easier. If it's a larger po population, it could be more difficult. Um, I don't know. You need to be open to the option, though, I think. Thank you, Pam. Bethany. Um, you know, similar to what, what Pim was just saying there, I think we've learned a lot about what worked well in remote learning and what didn't work this year. Um, we've made a lot of adjustments. I mean, I think about where we started last spring and where we've where we're landing the plane now, and we've learned a lot. Um, I think that it's important for us to keep sight that in order to do that, we really had to redeploy every resource available within the school. And so if this is an option that we want to pursue, um, we have to think really carefully about balancing uh, what resources we do have available so that we can provide a quality experience to all of our students. Thank you, Bethany. Okay, so I, to, to wrap up that initial question, I think Stephen, uh, when you meet with the staff and associations group, I think that's uh, absolutely a question that should be explored. Uh, Bethany and Anna, uh, for the administrative side of things, I think we need to begin exploring that. Um, and then, uh, and Katie, I hope you'll join Stephen's subcommittee perhaps as a teacher representative to, um, to speak through about how the, that might affect teachers as well. Sure. All right, um, moving on to this, the second question, just for initial feedback. Um, so that it's tied into the first, which is based on initial parent feedback about preference, how do we support remote learners? And so I think that will, uh, I think we'll get answers to that, that sort of bubble up after the subcommittee meetings and explore the first question in more um, detail. So the third question, are our safety protocols dependent on vaccination availability for students? Beth mentioned that in her comments about question one, um, that she believes it should be, right? Because uh, if vaccination is not available for younger students, then uh, perhaps protocols are tied to that. But let's speak about that in more detail. How do folks feel about uh, safety protocols? Um, and a very real world example, uh, this week, there is no vaccination available for our students younger than 12. And even students who are age 12 uh, have not had the chance to become fully vaccinated yet, but we have relaxed our uh, um, mass protocols because of the, the non-existent case counts um, in our town and in our schools. Um, so looking forward to the fall, if vaccination is not available for young students, um, what do we do about safety protocols? Anna. Very intuitive with my uh, mute off. I know Deanna will probably jump on this one, but um, it seems to me that it would make sense to also like this year, if it, there were a, a status, like you move to a green or orange, yellow, wh whatever they are, if something could be based again that way. So elementary, what does it mean to be uh, green? What does it mean to be yellow? And what were the protocols that, that come with that? Um, but I'm, I'm sure Deanna has more thoughts that she would like to share on her protocols. Deanna? I was looking for the raised hand thing, so I just found it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, <clears throat> well, it's gonna depend on where our community remains as well. Right now, community-wise, things are going well. Um, the, the rates are, as of yesterday, I think they were, 1.9, 2.8 the last few weeks. So that's really good for um, COVID rate in the area. It's lower, one of the lowest in the state. If as long as that stays low, um, there's also some staff that have not been vaccinated and choose not to for you know, some reasons, their, whatever their reasons are. But that's another consideration is how many staff are not vaccinated. And then what parents think with their children at school not being vaccinated. I mean, if the low, rate's low in the community, obviously it's gonna be safer, but what will we plan on doing regarding, you know, the travel that that is starting to come back into play uh, for a while, no one was going anywhere, but everyone's, you know, wholeheartedly going everywhere now. So that could change things. So I think it's still, you know, TBD, what's gonna happen. But initial feedback is perhaps the status levels could still exist and maybe cl more closely tied to community and school case counts. Is yeah, I think well. it's important to keep an eye on what's going on in our community. Absolutely. Any other feedback on that question? Go ahead, Bethany. 
and I, I'm going to speak as the proverbial middle child. Um, when we're thinking about that, uh, AMS is really split right down the middle in terms of the ages of our students. So um, I think part of what we'll have to think ahead to as well is what does it mean to have, you know, half a school where vaccinations are, um, students are eligible and potentially half a school where they're not? And um, what do safety protocols look like in, in that particular environment? That's a very good point. Anyone else? Okay, turning to the social and emotional uh, side of things. So uh, I, maybe perhaps an initial brainstorming session, but uh, um, we've already mentioned a little bit about uh, potential uh, orientation for, for example, uh, what will be sophomores who is their freshman year never stepped foot in Sohegan for sixth graders who never stepped foot in AMS or eighth graders from Mount Vernon who is seventh graders, you know, all of that. Um, but are there other, uh, um, beyond just the entry into the school year, are there other social and emotional resources and supports we think might need to be in place for next year? Go ahead, Tricia. Um, I, AMS last year, when everything was happening, I had a rising fifth grade at the time, and they did a really nice job bringing small groups just with their anchoring adult at the time. So for my son, it was his guidance counselor at the time, and they did groups in different waves, three, four at a time. So I think it's really important for those kiddos coming in if they have that choice, if they wanted to do an orientation or get to know their anchoring adult or anything like that. Um, for, for my son, it was it was great that he was able to come in not having been to the school and still giving that opportunity to, to get in there with his anchoring adult, which was really nice to see even amongst the having masks on and still keeping their distance and whatnot, but they did a really nice job. That's great, Tricia. Steven and then Sheila. Yeah, so this is actually, from, from my perspective, one of the most important things that we really need to work on this summer is to try to create that well-rounded experience for all kids in the fall. Um, for kids that we just don't know what they're going through right now because they have been remote all year, how do we engage those folks prior to the, the first day of school? Um, and I know in Mount Vernon, uh, we did a great job reaching out to each one of our remote students over the past couple of weeks, making sure that, yeah, they, they feel connected, they feel attached to the building, and more importantly, what else can we do to support them? But the piece that we also need to focus on is the parents, right? Making sure the parents of those students are engaged and actively involved in, 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 in that, that, that experience as well. Uh, and then from a faculty staff standpoint, there are faculty members that have been remote all year long. What do we need to do to re-engage those folks into uh, re-entry in, 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 in September and August? and hopefully working with uh, some of the services through our insurance provider to, to offer some, some additional guidance from that perspective. And hopefully Deanna's group can, can cover some of that stuff as well. Shilu and then Beth. What Steven said. <laughs> <laughs> you just took everything that I was gonna say. Um, yeah, I, I spot on um, really what I was thinking was uh, targeting everybody and really um, doing some proactive work to make sure that we're um, surrounding kids, even kids who have not been remote. It's going to be different walking into the school next year than it has been this past year and a half. Um, so we really, I think, bolstering everybody's ability to kind of be there for each other is going to be important. I agree. And, and someone uh, raised a question that uh, underscored something for me. So, so today walking into Sohegan and students without masks, I realized that just for myself, I wasn't used to making like that kind of facial contact with someone else. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of that uh, that will take some getting used to for students as well. And uh, there might be other kids who are unused to having uh, people and noise and distractions and all of that around them. It might take some time to get used to being in a social situation again, uh, for sure. Beth. Um, I feel like some of mine might loop into the next one a little bit, but it's all kind of that social slash emotional aspect. So we have kids that, whether it's um, Clark Wilkins, AMS, the high school that have been in one part of the building, um, you know, last time they were in the building and now they're moving up to a completely different section of the building. Um, so they don't know this new section, whether it's was, you know, fifth graders last year moving up to seventh graders, first graders last year moving up to third graders, it's different wings. Um, so they just don't know those areas of the building. Um, so they're gonna need that aspect. 
we're going to have some kids coming in for the first time in person um, with high anxiety. They aren't going to, you know, whether it's going to be high anxiety because they're around people, that many people again, or that many people in mass, mass, whatever the search situation is. Um, so they might need um, to use the my time spaces at our buildings that they typically weren't students that needed that before. Um, we're going to have students that don't really know anymore, especially some of our younger students, how to be in a classroom as a typical student um, because they've had the use of the mute function or, you know, they, they, they have had um, short um, bursts of Zooms here and there with breaks in between. So they're not gonna have that sustainability, um, whether in that mute function, whether it's they're not gonna know they need to not sit there and talk all the way through, or they're not gonna be used to their peers, um, you know, that constant noise from their peers. Um, and so those are all things that we need to be prepared for, um, our, especially the students that have been remote coming in, um, but also for our students that have been there in person, um, they're kind of in a way getting all new students um, that they haven't seen for months and months on end. And, you know, whether it's their friends that they've had all along, um, that reintegration is going to be really hard. And we're going to need to make sure that kids aren't kind of pushed aside, whether it, you know, and, you know, just making sure everybody kind of comes together again and that team building all over again, because it's, you know, as much as we tried, there are very different groups um, in school now. You know, there was the remote kids that haven't seen their in-person friends in 18 months. So things that we need to consider. Yeah, good points. And Beth, perhaps you can be in charge of teaching kids to wear deodorant again um, if they haven't for a long time. So we'll, we'll put you in charge of that. And put on real clothes every day. <laughs> yeah, pants. Yeah, pants for a change. So uh, Katie. I was just going to speak to what Beth was talking about. Obviously, I can only speak for Clark Wilkins, but I feel like we have responsive classroom at our school. We do so much of that building at the beginning of the year. We always take kids on tours around the building to show them where everything is. Um, you know, we do a lot of community building at the beginning of the year. So I feel thankful that we already have so much of that in place. I mean, obviously, certain kids might need a little bit more than that, but um, I think having that in place is helpful. It just sounds like we're going to have to be very intentional about the welcome back and the transitions and it feels to me like there's going to have to be like open houses almost for our schools for kids to like walk in the buildings and just get acclimated. Um, and no one can find their way around AMS so that that's 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 an issue every year but Bethany. Um, so two things one I think this is a reaffirmation of the importance of our anchoring adult work, so I think it's really important that. Um, you know, I think back on our, our educational programs that most of our faculty and staff have gone through and, um, you know, at most maybe there was a course on adolescent psychology or maybe, maybe a mention of social emotional learning. So really making sure that as we're asking staff to be more and more aware of the social emotional needs to make sure that we're providing adequate support uh, to support their learning, their professional growth and, and and making sure that we don't lose sight of supporting a, the teacher's social emotional well-being as well as the students. Um, they can't support the students if they're not well themselves. So um, just keeping that whole, you know, the whole community of learners at focus. Um, and the other thing I'm reminded of is um, I think we need to be very intentional and mindful that the experiences of students won't be lumped into groups and will be really individual. I, I was thinking as we were talking about this about the year that we tried at AMS to pull all of our Mount Vernon new seventh graders into a group and do this whole orientation through AMS together as a group. Um, and some of them really liked it and some of them were like, we are ready to like spread our wings. Like, why are you making us all stay together? So, be, right. So being really intentional of, of each student and um, offering opportunities, but not presuming that, you know, the student who's been remote needs this and the student who's been in person needs, needs that, but really creating pathways for students to access the resources and supports they need without making those decisions necessarily for them. I think it's important to keep that in mind. Sarah and then Tricia. Thank you. Um, actually, Bethany gave me the perfect segue because 
what I was thinking of is really that individualized experience and not presuming that, um, you know, that kids are going to be necessarily uh, coming in at a detriment, but really being able to open up conversations with them from, you know, a staff perspective with them um, and also a parent perspective with them to say, what did you learn over the course, you know, of this entire situation about how you learn? You know, are you someone who does better if you stand up when you're learning? Um, you know, do you do better if you have visual organizers or you're able to use your, your laptop to type instead of take notes, you know, with a, with a pen and paper? So I think that those kinds of conversations can also open up um, the, the dialogue about how kids experienced this past time frame um, from an educational standpoint, it may actually open up some opportunities to tap into what a good individual plan is for them, um, and also opens up that that ability to say what didn't work for me. You know, what do I know about myself now as a learner? And I think even you know, even as far as it, like a kindergartner could say, you know, I enjoy more time outside, or um, you know, I, I need to do a wiggle break. And you know, you may have a, a freshman or a sophomore, junior who says, you know, I really I, I like being able to stand up when I'm learning, or I like being able to uh, you know to type my notes. Um, and, and, you know, talk with my friend for a second while I'm figuring out this problem. So I think that those are opportunities, um, not necessarily, again, presuming that they're coming in at a detriment, but looking at that to say, what have we learned through this process? That's a great point. Yeah, we, for, for Anna Peril, she has wiggle breaks now built into her contract. So that's been helpful for her. Uh, Trisha. No, I kind of just basically what um, Dr. Burns Scotty was saying, I think it's going to be really important to look at both the faculty, staff, and students for remote. And basically ask them, what do they need? Um, remote learning is very different from in-person learning. Remote teaching is very per different than in-person teaching. Um, what worked, what didn't work? Um, and I think that's where the subcommittee work is really gonna come in handy, um, getting the perspectives of both the in-person and remote faculty, staff, and students, because what might work for those in person did not work for those remote and vice versa. So really just getting the viewpoint from all sides and, and making sure that it, it counts for them. All great feedback. Uh, so moving on, our last two questions we've, we've really covered. Um, and so uh, I want to pause and, and ask, are there other key questions that we should be asking that we are not asking yet? Beth. Um, I wasn't sure if you were going to go on to six and seven, so I had lowered my hand. But for six, um, we also need to take into consideration all of our homeschool students that are coming back into the building. We don't know where they are educationally, so we're going to need a lot of support for them as well. Not necessarily negative forms of support, but figuring, like Bethany said, figuring out exactly where they are, um, you know, it, in that type of a situation. So another great point. We've had a, a number of uh, 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 children that moved to homeschool this past year, and we've already received many of them that are notification that they're coming back to us next year. Deanna. Another thing I just think it's important to look at too is that kids coming from um, being remote learners, coming to the classroom, and again, learning the classroom rules, but teachers are having to be um, referees or, or monitors for like spacing. And it was wearing masks now, not so much, but other mitigation that we're still using that maybe the kids at home have not had to do because there's been nobody around. So there's gonna be a little bit of a learning curve for those kind of things uh, at, between the in-person and the remote kids. Without a doubt. Um, okay, any other questions that might need to be considered? Okay, so as we go through the, the subcommittees and their meetings, um, I'm going to, to leave it to uh, the chairs of those subcommittees to uh, make contact with the, the group of people they need to meet with and to set those meetings up um, and also to decide the membership of that subcommittee. Um, and uh, Trisha Town and I have already had conversations about the large number of people who wanna participate uh, in that particular subcommittee and, and uh, offer their opinion. So I'm happy to assist with, uh, with kind of the, the um, uh, what's the right word? Facilitation of that of subcommittee, Trisha. Um, it, but then uh, going through each subcommittee, I think some of the, the key questions, I'll, I'll go down from uh, top to bottom. So for the, the school nurses one, Deanna, uh, I think it's uh, really important for us to gather your feedback about 
Do we do things like a daily COVID screen? Um, uh, what do we, how do we handle the need for potential quarantine of students or staff? And is that dependent on whether we know someone's vaccination status? So the reason that's important is right now, uh, and the CDC guidelines could change, likely will change, uh, may have changed in the last 10 minutes and we don't know it, but um, the way it works now is uh, if, if, if me, Adam Steele, is exposed to someone with COVID, um, I no longer have to quarantine as a result of that being a close contact because Deanna has a copy of my vaccination record and knows that I'm, I've been vaccinated. Um, and, and so uh, if Katie Kennedy, I don't know if she's vaccinated or not, but if she's vaccinated and has not provided that proof to us that she's vaccinated, then we have to quarantine her for two weeks. Um, and even though she's vaccinated, if we don't know about it, we have to, or if she's not vaccinated at all, then we definitely have to. And so those kind of protocols need to be discussed amongst the nurses about how we handle that. Do we um, uh, keep those records for students as well? Um, or if, if someone's identified as a close contact, then do we ask the parents to provide a copy of, like as a get out of jail free card uh, to avoid the, the quarantine process? So. I think we'll need uh, really need you, Deanna, to work with the, the medical folks to start answering those protocol um, type questions. Um, for Anna and Bethany with principals and administration, um, I think it's in, in concert with SheLu's group, uh, really this welcoming back to school process, so like the reorientation, but then the ongoing supports and how we facilitate that as well as the potential remote supports that we have. And I think really keying in on Stephen's point about uh, is there a way to provide an, a, a, uh, a reasonable facsimile of the in-person environment for students that did better in a remote modality. And so I think that's for initial things for you guys to tackle is really around there. Um, Stephen, for the faculty, staff and associations, um, in addition to the other things we've talked about, I think there needs to be a conversation about what happens regarding staff leave time in the case that they are required to quarantine because they've chosen not to be vaccinated or they're choosing not to tell us that they've been vaccinated. So it's a, it's a real sticky issue. I'm not going to uh, uh, hedge around it. Um, it's a precarious situation if someone is forced to be quarantined because they've chosen not to be vaccinated or chosen not to tell us. And it's not really something that qualifies for sick time or sick leave. And so how do we handle that? Um, that's going to be, uh, I hope not an issue that, uh, that rears its ugly head, but I'm, I'm worried about that one. So I think Stephen, that one in particular will require some work amongst uh, that group of people. Um, Tricia, for the parents and community members, um, I think, uh, we need to really understand what parents are thinking about uh, the reentry uh, for those students that have been gone for a long time. Um, I think we uh, need to validate what we believe is kind of a working hypothesis that once students are vaccinated or have the opportunity to be vaccinated, that protocols can be changed. Um, I think we need to just validate if that's how the wider community feels. Um, Maddie from students, uh, from their perspective, just all of the, the social emotional things I think are the most important. Um, uh, and what students will need for support moving forward. Um, and then I think also the question about is, should remote be an option for kids uh, unrelated to COVID? I think that one as well would be very curious to hear the student perspective about that. Um, and then Sheila, your job's easy. Just figure out how we support 2,400 students next year. So, um, you know, I, I would say Sheila, uh, for you and your group, um, you guys could even begin sketching out what you think the plans ought to look like for those supports, because you guys are, are, are really know it best and, and you could probably report back and tell us what you think, what your group thinks we ought to be doing both for the reentry and then the ongoing, because um, pretty much what you guys say is what we're probably gonna wanna support. So, so those are my thoughts for your subcommittee meetings. Um, are there others that I've missed or other, other points? All right, one uh, sticky wicket I want to acknowledge. Um, this past year, we were able to uh, borrow all of our previous year's money from unassigned fund balance and then uh, uh, eventually federal grant dollars. Um, our upcoming budgets that'll be voted on tomorrow uh, that we hope all will pass. Um, we did not budget any special COVID related funds and it's, it's unclear whether we'll have 
grant dollars that we'll be able to apply. Um, I don't think our federal grants for COVID that we received this year will expire this year necessarily. Um, but Amy, I think that's a question that you might need to report back onto us uh, about do we have resources over and above our budget available to us or not? Because my, my fear is that we may not. Um, so that's just one sticky wicket I wanted to, to call out. So besides that, easy work, nothing, uh, Nothing like last year, in my opinion. I feel uh, my personal anxiety level is about a quarter of what it was last year at this time. So um, I look forward to doing this with all of you. Um, any final questions or comments before we call it a successful first meeting? All right, well, hey, I thank all of you for your time. I very much appreciate it. And we'll see all of you back here on June 30th at four. Have a good day, everybody. Take care.